Good morning. Dr. Dennis L. Waters here. Glad you're here. Glad you have downloaded this podcast. Looking forward to our taking the journey together. Today, we're going to be talking about a few things. But one of the things I hope to share with you today is an item that I wrote on the back of a book that I did. It was called The Steps to Christ Study Workbook. Uh, It's based on a book that had been written by a uh, person that I admire a great deal. Uh, I was within a particular denomination, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, a worldwide church. Um, One of the founders of that church was a woman named uh, Ellen G. White. Uh, There's a statement in one of her books, I believe it is, The Ministry of Healing, the particular copy that I had. Um, it was, if I remember correctly, it was on page 252 of that particular book. And in that book, she had written this particular statement. Listen to it very carefully. She said, it is a law of nature that our thoughts and feelings are encouraged as we give them utterance. Think about that statement now. It is a law of nature that our thoughts and feelings are encouraged as we give them utterance. In other words, they become, our thoughts and feelings become greater, stronger, more powerful, the more we talk about them. And she said it was the law of nature. And when I read that particular item, I began to understand that one, it was the same thing that Jesus said, it is done unto you as you believe. It is done unto you as you believe. And then there's another statement that he says in the book of the book of Mark, I believe it is, verses 11, uh, excuse me, the book of Mark, the 11th chapter and verses 23 and 24, where he says basically the same thing, where he talks about the aspect of praying and saying and believing that it is already done and that one would receive the same statement said over and over again. And then in the book of Joel, let the weak say, I am strong. Let the weak say, I am strong. And so this idea today comes forth in this time where it talks about affirmations. It is the same thing. And so that's what we're going to talk about. But we're going to take a different course into that. Here's a little music as we talk about it today, as we come forth. Welcome by the way, to this day. Here's a little music. You know the song. We're going to play it again. It's called Northern Lights. Northern Lights. Northern Lights. Northern Lights is the name of the song. I mentioned that I had written this book. It's still on Amazon. It's still for sale. We're going to do a study of that where we're going to be talking about this particular book, uh, the Steps Christ Study Workbook. It has the intent 
that an individual would be able to actually study along with a group of individuals. And no matter who you are, when you're studying along with a group of individuals, what takes place is that you write out your answers to the individual questions. And then in the group, you get a chance to say what it is that you, as you have interacted with the book, prayerfully interacted with the book, you get to speak your particular statement about what you and spirit have brought forth as the answer to that. And so you get to say what you understand to be the truth of that particular statement, uh, that particular statement that you have written. And so that's what we're taking that's what's taking place. We've done this a number of times uh, with individuals, and it is amazing when people get together and they are able to actually state what they believe, what they have received from spirit, because you just never know what spirit may be doing with an individual, their particular circumstances in life, and how spirit would be speaking in the most unusual people, it seems. Uh, God has a way of showing up and speaking to people, and he does that to every individual. Uh, God is, you know, will speak through any available channel that is, uh, you know, just open to receiving the word of God. Here's what we wrote on the back of the of the uh, Steps of Christ Study Workbook, uh, the original one, the first one. Uh, we've had about three different copy, uh, covers for this particular book since it's coming forth in 1997. It says, from the center, in the center, in the center of life, in the center of the life, live from the center. The oak is in the acorn. The tree is in the seed. The better country, the better community, the better spiritual family, church, synagogue, mosque, and people is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. Many people want to change and transform things and people outside of themselves without first being transformed. This methodology brings no lasting growth, no lasting betterment. A wiser way is changed from the center, changed from the inside, the epicenter that spreads outward, upward, and forward. An acorn is the beginning of massive change in landscape. The seed is the beginning of great change in beauty, and bounty. You are the beginning of tremendous change in community, family, church, synagogue, mosque, and people. The book Steps to Christ is about changing the land by changing the man, a woman, boy, girl. The Steps to Christ study workbook guides you in digesting and distributing the food for change found inside this classic volume. Steps to Christ study workbook, uh, Steps to Christ the book, was actually lit, written in the, I believe it was around 1901 or something to that effect. I'd have to check the actual date of it again. But the step, that's why I called it a classic volume. So let me get back. This Steps to Christ study workbook guides you in digesting and distributing the food for change found inside this classic volume. By stimulating new thoughts, and opening up for investigation old ideas, you are planting the acorn of truth in the midst of the people landscape of this world. The seed idea of acknowledging one's need of help. The seed idea of repentance, which means change. The seed idea of trust. The seed idea of life first and growth to follow. Planted in the center of your being ensures massive, great, tremendous, change, growth, and development. So, my friend, a better world is within you, and in your hands is the key, the passport, the seed, the acorn, the beginning you need to get us all there. From the center, in the center, in the center of the life, live from the center. From the center, in the center, in the center of the life, live from the center. So I wrote that. Spirit inspired it, me to write that. Now, the amazing thing about it is that I had not read another author that I've come to love a great deal. That author 
is a fellow named Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson. He has an article that I want to read now. His article, his essay is entitled Circles, and it's very much in line with what I wrote. And I may have done this before, you may have heard me do this before, but at this particular moment in 2022, which is this year, I feel very much inspired to do it again. Circles by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Nature centers into balls, B-A-L-L-S, and are proud ephemerals, fast to surface and outside, scanned the profile of the spear, knew they what that signified, a new genesis were here. That's his poem that he has before the article. The eye is a first circle. The horizon which it forms is a second. And throughout nature, this primary figure is repeated without end. It is the highest emblem in the cipher, cipher of the world. St. Augustine described the nature of God as a circle whose center was everywhere and its circumference nowhere. We are all our lifetime reading the copious sense of this first of forms. Our moral we have already deduced in considering the circular or compensatory character of every human action. Another analogy we shall now trace that every action admits of being outdone. Our life is an apprenticeship to the truth that around every circle another can be drawn, that there is no end in nature, but every end is a beginning, that there is always another dawn risen on mid-noon, and under every deep a lower deep opens. This fact, as far as it symbolizes the moral fact of the unattainable, the flying perfect, around which the hand of man can never meet, at once the inspirer and the condemner of every success, may conveniently serve us to connect many illustrations of human power in every department. There are no fixtures in nature. The universe is fluid and volatile. Permanence is but a word of degrees. Our globe, seen by God, is a transparent law not a mass of facts. The law dissolves the fact and holds it fluid. Our culture is the predominance of an idea which draws after it this train of cities and institutions. Let us rise into another idea. They will disappear. The Greek sculpture is all melted away as if it had been statues of ice here and there a solitary figure or a fragment remaining, as we see flecks and scraps of snow left in cold dells and mountain clefts in June and July. For the genius that created it creates now something else. The Greek letters last a little longer, but are already passing under the same sentence and tumbling into the inevitable pit which the creation of new thought opens for all that is old. The new continents are built out of the ruins of an old planet. The new races fed out of the decomposition of the foregoing. New arts destroy the olds. See the investment of capital in aqueducts made useless by hydraulics, fortification, by gunpower, roads and canals, by railways, sails, by steam, steam by electricity. You admire the tower of granite weathering the hurts of so many ages, yet a little wavering hand built this huge wall, and that which builds is better than that which is built. The hand that built can topple it down much faster. Better than the hand and nimbler was the invisible thought which walked through it.
and thus ever behind the course effect is a final cause, which being narrowly seen is itself the effect of a final cause. Everything looks permanent until its secret is known. A rich estate appears to women a firm and lasting fact. To a merchant, one easily created out of any material and easily lost. In an orchard, good tillage, good ground seems a fixture like a gold mine or a river to a citizen, but to a large farmer, not much more fixed than the state of the crop. Nature looks provokingly stable and secular, but it has a cause like all the rest. And when once I comprehend that, will these fields stretch so immovably wide, these leaves sing, hang so individually considerable? Permanence is a word of degrees. Everything is medial. Moons are no more bounds to spiritual power than bat balls. The key to every man is his thought. Sturdy and defying, though he look, he has a helm, H-E-L-M, he has a helm which he obeys, which is the idea after which all his facts are classified. He can only be reformed by showing him a new idea which commands his own. The life of a man is a self-evolving circle, which from a ring imperceptibly small, rushes on all sides outward to a new and larger circle, and that without end. The extent to which this generation of circles, wheels without wheels, will go depends on the force or truth of the individual soul. For it is the inert effort of each thought, having formed itself into a circular wave of circumstance, as for instance, an empire, rules of an art, a logical usage, a religious right, to heap itself on that ridge and to solidify and him in the life. But if the soul is quick and strong, it bursts over that boundary on all sides and expands another orbit on the great deep, which also runs up into a high wave, will uh, with attempt again to stop and to bind but the heart refuses to be imprisoned. In its first and narrowest pulses, it already tends outward with a vast force and to immense and innumerable expansions. Every ultimate fact is only the first of a new series. Every general law, only a particular fact of some more general law presently to disclose itself. There's no outside no enclosing wall, no circumference to us. The man finishes his story. How good, how final, how it puts a new face on all things. He feels the sky. Lo, on the other side rises also a man and draws a circle around the circle we had just pronounced the outline of the spear. Then already is our first speaker not man, but only a first speaker. His only redress is forthwith to draw a circle outside of his antagonists, and so men do by themselves. The result of today, which haunts the mind and cannot be escaped, will presently be abridged into a word, and the principle that seemed to explain nature will itself be included as one example of a bold generalization. In the thought of tomorrow, there is a power to upheave all thy creed, all the creeds, all the literature of the nations, and marshal thee to a heaven which no epic dream has yet depicted. Every man is not so much a workman in the world as he is a suggestion of that he should be. Men walk as prophecies of the next age. Step by step, we scale this mysterious ladder. The steps are actions. The new prospect is power. Every several result is threatened and judged by that which follows. Everyone seems to be contradicted by the new. It is only limited by the new. The new statement is always hated by the old. And to those dwelling in the old comes like an abyss of skepticism. But the eye soon gets wanted to it. For the eye and it 
are effects of one cause, then its innocence and benefit appear, and presently all its energy spent, it pales and dwindles before the revelation of the new hour. Fear not the new generalization. Does the fact look crash and material, threatening to degrade thy theory of spirit? Resist it not. It goes to refine and raise thy theory of matter just as much. There are no fixtures to men if we appeal to consciousness. Every man supposes himself not to be fully understood. And if there is any truth in him, if he rests at last on the divine soul, I see with him, I see not how it can be otherwise. The last chamber, the last closet he must feel was never open. There's always a, resid a residuum, unknown, unanalyzable. Let me do that once more. Let me just go back. Every man supposes himself not to be fully understood. And if there is any truth in him, if he rests at last on the divine soul, I see not how it can be otherwise. The last chamber, the last closet, he must feel was never open. There's always a residuum unknown, unanalyzable. That is, every man believes that he has a greater possibility. Our moods do not believe in each other. Today I am full of thoughts and can write what I please. I see no reason why I should not have the same thought, the same power of expression tomorrow. What I write, whilst I write it, seems the most natural thing in the world. But yesterday I saw a dreary, dreary vacuity in this direction in which now I see so much. And a month hence, I doubt not, I shall wonder who he was that wrote so many continuous pages. Alas for this infirm fate, this will not strenuous, this vast ebb of a vast flow. I'm God in nature, I'm a weed by the wall. The continuous effort to raise himself above himself, to work a pitch above his last height, betrays itself in man's relations. We thirst for appropriation, approbation, yet cannot forgive the approver. The sweet of nature is love, yet if I have a friend, I am tormented by my imperfections. The love of me accuses the other party. If he were high enough to slight me, then could I love him and rise by my affection to new heights. A man's growth is seen in the successive choirs of his friends. For every friend whom he loses for truth, he gains a better. I thought as I walked in the woods and mused on my friends, why should I play with them this game of idolatry? I know and see too well when not voluntarily blind, the speed limits of persons called high and worthy. Rich and noble, great they are by the liberal liberality of our speech, but truth is sad. O blessed spirit, whom I forsake for thee, they are not thou. Every personal consideration that we allow cost us heavenly state. We sell the throne of angels for a short and turbulent pleasure. How often must we learn this lesson? Men cease to interest us when we find their limitations. The only sin is limitation. As soon as we once come up with a man's limitation, it is all over with him. Has he talent? Has he enterprise? As he knowledge, it boots not. Infinitely alluring and attractive was he to you yesterday, a great hope, a sea to swim in. Now you have found his shores, 
found it a pawn, and you care not if you never see him again. Every new step we take in thought reconciles 20 seemingly discordant facts as expressions of one law. Aristotle and Plato are reckoned the respective heads of two schools. A wise man will see the Aristotle Platonizes. By going one step farther back in thought, discordant opinions are reconciled by being seen to be two extremes of one principle. And we can never go so far back as to preclude a still higher vision. Beware, when the great God lets loose a thinker on the planet, let me read that again. Beware, when the great God lets loose a thinker on the planet, things all, then all things are at risk. It is as when a conflagration has broken out in a great city and no man knows what is safe or where it will end. There's not a piece of science, but it flanks may be turned tomorrow. There's not any literature, literary reputation, not the so-called eternal names of flame, of fame, that may not be revised and condemned. The very hopes of man, the thoughts of his heart, the religion of nations, the manners and morals of mankind are all at the mercy of a new generalization. Generalization is always a new influx of the divinity into the mind, hence the thrill that attends it. Valor consists in the power of self-recovery so that a man cannot have his flank turned, cannot be out general, but put him where he you will he stands. This can only be by his preferring truth to his past apprehension of truth and his alert acceptance of it from whatever quarter. The entropy Conviction that his laws, his relationships to society, his Christianity, his world may at any time be superseded and deceased. There are degrees in idolism. We learned first to play with it academically, as the magnet was once a toy. Then we see in the heyday of youth and poetry that it may be true that it is true in gleams and fragments. Then his countenance waxes stern and grand, and we see that it must be true. Not may be true, it must be true. It now shows itself ethical and practical. We learn that God is. We learn that God is in me and that all things are shadows of him. The idealism of Berkeley is only a crude statement of the idealism of Jesus. And that again is a crude statement of the fact that all nature is a rapid efflux of goodness executing and organizing itself. Much more obviously is history and the state of the world at any one time directly dependent on the intellectual classification then existing in the minds of men. The things which are clear and dear to men at this hour are so on account of the ideas which have emerged on their mental horizon and which cause the present order of things as a tree bears its apples. A new degree of culture would instantly revolutionize the entire system of human pursuits. Conversation is a game of circles. In conversation, we pluck up the termina, which bound the common of silence on every side. The parties are not to be judged by the spirit they partake and even express under this Pentecost. Tomorrow they will recede from this high water mark. Tomorrow you will find them stooping under the old pack saddles. Yet let them enjoy the cloven fame. 
whilst it glows on their walls. When each new speaker strikes a new light, emancipates us from the oppression of the last speaker, to oppress us with the greatness and exclusiveness of his own thought, then yields us to another redeemer. We seem to recover our rights to become men. Oh, what truths profound and executable only in ages and orbs are supposed in the announcement of every truth. In common hours, society sits cold and statuous. We all stand waiting, empty, knowing possibly that we can be fooled, surrounded by mighty symbols which are not symbols to us, but prose and trivial toys. Then come at the God and converts the statues into fiery men. And by a flash of his eye burns up the veil which shrouded all things. And the meaning of the very furniture of cup and saucer, of chair and clock and tester is manifest. The facts which loom so large in the fog of yesterday, property, climate, breeding, personal beauty and the like has strangely changed their proportions. All that we reckon settled shakes and rattles. And literature, cities, climates, religions leave their foundation and dance before our eyes. And yet here again, see the swift circumspection. Good as is discourse, silence is better and shames it. The length of the discourse indicates the distance of thought betwixt the speaker and the hearer. If they were at a perfect understanding in any part, no words would be necessary thereon. If at one in all parts, no words would be suffered. Literature is a point outside of our Hordino circle through which a new one may be described. The use of literature is to afford us a platform whence we may command a view of our present life, a purchase by which we may move it. We fill ourselves with ancient learning, install ourselves the best we can in Greek and Pornic and Roman houses, only that we may wiser see French, English, and American houses and modes of living. In like manner, we see literature best from the midst of wild nature, or from the den of affairs, or from a high religion. The field cannot be well seen from within the field. The astronomer must have his diameter of the Earth's orbit as a base to find the parallax of any star. Therefore, we value the poet. All the arguments and all the wisdom is not in the encyclopedia or in the treatise of metaph on metaphysics or the body of divinity, but in the sonnet or the play. In my daily work, I incline to repeat my old steps and do not believe in the remedial force, in the power of change and reform. But when Petrarch or Aristo feel with the new wine of his imagination writes me an old or brisk romance, full of daring thought and action. He smites and arouses me with his shrill tones, breaks up my whole chain of habits, and I open my eyes on my own possibilities. He clasps wings to the sky of all the solid old lumber of the world, and I am capable once more of choosing a straight path in theory and practice. We have the same need to command a view of the religion of the world. We can never see Christianity from the catechism, from the pasture, from a boat in the pond, from the, amidst the songs of the wood birds, and possibly we may. Cleanse all the elemental lights and winds, deep in the sea of beautiful form, with the fields open. We may chance to cast a right glance back upon biography. Christianity is rightly dear to the best of mankind, yet was there never a young philosopher whose breeding had fallen into the Christian church by whom that brave text of Paul was not specially prized. Then shall also the Son 
be subject unto him who put all things on him, that God may be all in all. That the claims and virtues of persons be never so great and welcome. The indistinct, the instinct of man presses eagerly onward to the impersonal and illimitable, great and welcome, and gladly arms itself against the dogmatism of bigots with this generous word out of the book. The natural world may be conceived of as a system of concentric circles, and we now and then detect in nature's slight dislocations which apprise us that this surface on which we now stand is not fixed but sliding. These manifold tenacious qualities, this chemistry and vegetation, these metals and animals which seem to stand here for their own sake are means and methods only, are words of God and as fugitives as other words. Has the naturalist or chemist learned his craft? Who has explored the gravity of atoms and the elective affinities? Who has not yet discerned the deeper laws whereof this is only a partial or approximate statement, namely that light draws to light and that the goods which belong to you gravitate to you and need not be pursued with pain and cost? Yet is that statement approximate also and not final. Omnipresence is a higher fact. Not through subtle subterranean channels need friend and fact be drawn to their counterpart, but rightly considered, these things proceed from the eternal generation of the soul. Cause and effect are two sides of one fact. The same law of eternal progress procession ranges all that we call the virtues and extinguishes each in the light of a better. The great man will not be prudent in the popular sense. All his prudence will be so much deduction from his grandeur. But it behoves each of us to see when he sacrifices prudence to what God he devotes it. If to ease and pleasure, he had better be prudent still. If to a great trust, he can well spare his mule and panners who has a winged chariot instead. Godfrey draws on his boots to go through the woods that his feet may be safer from the bites of snakes. Aaron never thinks of such a pearl. In many years, neither is harmed by such an accident. Yet it seems to me that with every precaution you take against such an evil, you put yourself into a power of the evil. I suppose that the highest prudence is the lowest prudence. If this too sudden a rushing from the center to the verge of our orbit. Think how many times we shall fall back into the pitiful calculations before we take up our rest in the great sentiment or make the verge of today the new center. Besides, your bravest sentiment is familiar to the humblest men. The poor and low have their way of expressing the last facts of philosophy as well as you. Blessed be nothing, and the worse things are, the better they are are proverbs which express the transcendentalism, transcendentalism, transcendentalism of common life. One man's justice is another man's injustice. One man's beauty, another's ugliness. One man's wisdom, another's folly. As one beholds the same objects from a higher point. One man thinks justice consists in paying debts and has no measure in his abhorrence of another who is very remiss in his duty and makes the creditor wait tediously. But that second man has his own way of looking at things, asks himself, which debt must I pay first, the debt to the rich or the debt to the poor, the debt of money or the debt of thought of, to mankind, of genius of, to nature? For you, broker, O oh broker, there is no other principle but arithmetic. For me, commerce is a trivial import. Love, faith, truth of character, aspiration of man, they are sacred. Nor can I detach one duty like you from all other duties and concentrate my forces mechanically on the payment of monies. Let me live onward. You shall find that, though slower, the progress of my character will liquidate all these debts without injustice to higher claims. 
if a man should dedicate himself to the payment of notes, would not this be injustice? Does he owe no debt but money? And are all claims on him to be postponed to a landlord or a banker? There is no virtue which is final. All are initial. The virtues of society are vices to the same. The terror of reform is the discovery that we must cast away our virtues, or what we have always esteemed such, into the same pit that has consumed our grosser vices. Forgive his crimes, forgive his virtues too. Those smaller faults have converts to the right. It is the highest power of divine moments that they abolish our contritions also. I accuse myself of slough and unprofitableness day by day. But when these waves of God flow into me, I no longer reckon lost time. I no longer poorly compute my possible achievements by what remains to me of the month or the year. For these moments confer a sort of omnipresence and omnipotency, which asks nothing of duration, but sees that the energy of the mind is commiserate with the work to be done without time. And thus, O circular philosopher, I hear some reader exclaim, you have arrived at a fine pluralism, at an equivalence and indifference of all actions, and would fain teach us that if we are true, forsooth, our crimes may be lively stones out of which we shall construct a temple of the true God. I'm not careful to justify myself. I own, I am gladdened by seeing the predominance of the sacred principle throughout the vegetable nature and not less by beholding in morals that unrestrained inundation of the principle of good into every chink and hole that selfishness has left open, yea, into the selfishness and sin itself, so that no evil is pure, no hell itself without its extreme satisfactions, but lest I should mislead any when I have my own head and obey my whims, let me remind the reader that I am only an experimenter. Do not set the least value on what I do or the least discredit on what I do not, as if I pretend to settle anything as true or false. I unsettle all things. No facts to me are sacred, none are profane. I simply experiment, an endless seeker with no pass at my back. Yet this incessant movement and progression with all things partake, which all things partake, could never become sensible to us, but by contrast to some principle of fixture or stability in the soul. While the internal, whilst the internal generation of circles proceed the external generation whilst the eternal generation of circles proceeds the ex the eternal generator abides that central life is somewhat superior to creation superior to knowledge and thought contains all its circles. Forever it labels, labels to create a life and thought as large and excellent as itself, but in vain. For that which is made instructs how to make a better. Let me read that all over again. This is vital. The, what, what, he, what I just read is vital. I don't know that I had read it exactly like that before. And thus, O circular philosopher, 
I hear some reader exclaim, you have arrived at a fine pyronism. I think that means like something that's in fire. Like what you have arrived at after all of that is that something that could be burned up and it turns to ashes. At an equivalency and indifference of all actions and would fain teach us that if we are true, forthwith our crimes may be lively stones out of which we shall construct the temple of the true God. And then Emerson says, I am not careful to justify myself. I own OWN. I am gladdened by seeing the predominance of the sacred principle throughout vegetable nature. So that basically nature is like something that is in a fire and it's gone. It has no lasting value to it, like a tree or anything in nature. You know, it has its seasons that is here for a while and then the tree is bare. And not least by beholding in morals that unrestrained inundation of the principle of good into every chink and hole that selfishness has left open, yea, into selfishness and sin itself, so that evil is pure, nor hell itself without its approbations, I believe he said. In other words, there is some good even in what happens. It has, that you may consider bad, or the Satan says all things work together for good for those who love God. But then he says, but lest I should mislead any when I have my own head and obey my whims. So he says, I may be found to do something wrong. Let me remind the reader that I am only an experimenter. Do not set the least value on what I do. In other words, don't follow me in the things that I do. Don't set me as an example for what I do. Let me remind the reader that I am only an experimenter. Do not set the least value on what I do or the least discredit what I do not do. If I don't do it, don't take that as an example of what not to do. As if I pretend to settle anything as true or false. I unsettle all things. In other words, questions all things. He examines all things. It's his life to decide what he will or will not do. No facts are sacred to me. He examines everything. It's his life. None are profane. Just because somebody else says that something is truth or something is a lie is not a fact to him or even what history has said. He says, I simply experiment. I'm an endless seeker with no past at my back. He's like a fresh living of this thing called life. Yet this incessant or continuous movement and progression which all things partake could never become sensible to us but by contrast to some principle of fixture or stability in the soul. So there has to be an anchor. There has to be some foundation, something fixed. So that's what he's looking for. And says, whilst the internal, whilst the eternal generation of circles proceeds. So from the, from the center, there's a center. The generation of circles keeps taking place. It gets wider and wider and wider. He says the eternal generator abides. So if you say the point is right there in the center, there's a point. But the circles keeps widening. widening. Then he says that center circle or that center point is eternal. The circles keep widening. 
and the that's the eternal generation of circles that keeps going but so is that center that keeps abiding as well and that's what he's talking about this that center life is somewhat superior to the creation superior to knowledge and thought and contains all its circles so that center contains all the circles no matter how wide they get this this is why i had to do that over that's powerful forever it labeled labels l-a-b-o-r-s to create a life and thought as large and excellent as itself but in vain for that which is made instructs how to make a better for that which is made instructs how to make a better thus there is no sleep no pause no preservation but all things renew germinate and spring why should we import rags and relics into the new hour nature abhors abhors the old and old age seems the only disease all others run into this one we call it by many names fever intemperance insanity stupidity and crime they're all forms of old age they are risk conservation conservatism appropriation inertia not newness not the way onward we giggle every day i see no need of it while we converse with what is above us we do not grow old but grow young infancy youth receptive receptive aspiring with religious eye looking up would count itself nothing and abandons itself to the instructions flowing from all sides but the man and woman of 70 assumes to know all they have outlived their hope they renounce aspiration except the actual for the necessary and talk down to the young let them then become organs of the holy ghost let them be lovers let them behold truth and their eyes are uplifted their wrinkles smooth they are perfumed again with hope and power this old age ought not to creep on the human mind in nature every moment is new the past is always swallowed and forgotten the coming only is sacred nothing is secure but life transition the energizing spirit no love can be bound by oath or covenant to secure it against a higher love no truth so sublime but it may be trivial tomorrow in the light of new thought people wish to be settled only as far as they are unsettled is there any hope for them life is a series of surprises we do not guess today the mood the pleasure the power of tomorrow when we are building up our being of lower states of acts of routine and sense we can tell somewhat but the masterpieces of god the total growth and universal movements of the soul he hide it they are incalculable i can know that truth is divine and helpful but how it shall help me i can have no guess for so to be is a soul inlet of so to know the new position of the advancing man has all the power of the old yet has them all new it carries in its bosom all the energies of the past yet is itself an exhalation of the morning i cast away in this new moment 
all my once hoarded knowledge is vacant and vain. Now for the first time, seem I to know anything rightly. The simplest words, we do not know what they mean except when we love and aspire, aspire. Let me read that. The simplest words, we do not know what they mean except when we love and aspire. The difference between talents and character is adroitness to keep the old and trodden round and power and courage to make a new road and better goals. Character makes an overpowering present and cheerful determined hour, which fortifies all the company by making them see that much is possible and excellent that was not thought of. Character dulls the impression of particular events. When we see the conqueror, we do not think much of any one battle or success. We see that we have exaggerated the difficult. It was easy for him. The great man is not convulsible or tormentable. Events pass over him without much impression. People say sometimes, see what I have overcome? See how cheerful I am? See how completely I have triumphed over these black events? Not if they still remind me of the black events. True conquest is the causing the calamity to fade and disappear as an early cloud of insignificant results in a history so large and advancing. The one thing which we seek with insatiable desire is to forget ourselves, to be surprised out of our propriety, to lose our Simipitio memory and to do something without knowing how or why in short to draw a new circle. Nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. The way of life is wonderful. It is by abandoning it. The great moments of history are the faculties of performance through the strength of ideas as the works of genius and religion. A man, said Oliver Cromwell, never rises so high as when he knows not whither he is going. Dreams and drunkenness, the use of opium and alcohol are the semblance and counterfeit of this oracular genius, and hence their dangerous attraction to men. For the like reason, they ask the aid of wild passions, as in gaming and war, to aid in some manners these flames and generosities of the heart. This is an amazing, an amazing read for me to read all of this all the way through from Ralph Waldo Emerson. I say that because while his is written out, <laughs> I'm one of those individuals that is actually many times accused of being what they call long-winded. I could wish in a certain kind of way to be able to write as well as Ralph Waldo Emerson and express thoughts in such a way that he is are expressed. And the touch goes many places. When I look at what I wrote, it intends all of that. I intend all of that. But that is so powerful. And 
if individuals would read it and apply it, if you, the listener, would read it and apply it, I know it's long. And you can download it, you can find it on the web, or again, it's just so powerful. So many of the items from Ralph Waldo Emerson are so powerful. As he quotes Oliver Cromwell, let me just do that again. Let me begin at this, this one page, one paragraph, really. The one thing which we seek with insatiable desire is to forget ourselves. To be surprised out of our propriety. To lose our sempiternal memory. And to do something without knowing how or why. In short, to draw a new circle. Nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. The way of life is wonderful. It is by abandoning it. Abandoning, giving yourself totally to something, completely to something. Or to someone. The great moments of history are the faculties Facilities, really, great moments of history are the facilities of performance through the strength of ideas as the works of genius and religion. A man, said Oliver Cromwell, never rises so high as when he knows not whither he is going. Dreams and drunkenness, remember what he just said. Dreams and drunkenness, the use of opioid and alcohol, are the semblance and counterfeits of this auricular, auricular genius. So some people, in order to get to the place of abandonment and self-forgetfulness, they do the opium and the alcohol. That's what they do. And hence, their dangerous attraction for men. For the like reason, they ask the aid of the wild passions. Remember what he's saying there is that people want to forget themselves, and so they, they, they want to get caught up in something. That's why they go gaming or gambling and all that kind of stuff. Get caught up whatever that gaming, everything like that. And this day and time, you have this whole thing that's taking place with, you can go and gamble and do all kinds of things. I mean, it's everywhere, okay, in the U.S. at least. You know, we got it on television. You got so many games, continuous, that you can, people play. And uh, you got the, whether it's golf, tennis, uh, basketball, football, hockey, all this kind of stuff. People will get into it so much. Because then they can abandon themselves or forget themselves and just get into it and then talk about it, you know, whether the game is on or off, or whatever it may be. It's, they used to talk about genius and religion, but now 24 7 sports channels and all of that. It's the same thing with war. We had the situation with today, Ukraine, but you can count the history of America or the history of the world. How long has there been or has there ever been a period of time in which there has truly been peace on earth? And why do people love war? Why do people love killing? Because there's so much Forgetfulness, it goes into war. There's so much abandonment. You're doing it for country. 
all of that stuff that's going on in a person's mind to the point that they must forget themselves. It's not just self-preservation that's involved with that. There's this aspect that you must do it for country, for home, for family, for loved ones. And there was a piece in here where I read where there was actually the thought that came now. Today is the 20th of May, 2022, that I'm reading this. And I thought of the situation that we face in America right now, where recently we had a mass shooting that took place in a place called Buffalo, New York. And it has to do with the changes that have taken place in the country. And the statement that is made here is that permanence is but a word of degrees. And people have in mind that they want something that they consider to be permanent to remain. And that the world is changing. The U.S. is changing. The world is changing. I mean, every civilization, if you want to call it that, has had to face change. I find it amazing. I just find it amazing that these things are so that they are so. When I grew up, I had this experience, really, of a little TV that we were able to watch. And on it, there were things that, you know, I guess for entertainment or whatever, but it was amazing because we didn't know, like so many times people don't know, the difference between what is true and what is fantasy. And so there was this fellow called Tarzan, who was just a wonderful fellow, running through what we were told were the, the jungles of Africa. You could talk to the animals, command the people who were native to Africa, the people who were native that we were shown were black, of course. And he seemed amazingly smart to solve all of their problems, but he just happened to be white, Caucasian. He was their savior. It was amazing. Most of the heroes that I saw happened to be white. I was a bit older when I finally went to Africa. To Egypt, to Israel. Still older when I went to Kenya. Before that, I had understood Alex Haley's tracing of his roots. And then I did my own. I recognize when I trace my own roots that they go to both, as I tell people, England and to Africa. I am America. From what I understand, my ancestors were here before the Revolutionary War. I am America.
Remember that each circle moves from the center. When one circle is drawn, and there's another one drawn on the outside of the circumference of the fast circle drawn. And I'm drawing a new circle. We have nothing to fear about the future. Nothing. That America, this new country, this new country, this new type of civilization, become what it was destined to be. It was a new beginning, not written in stone any more than anything else in history has been written in stone. The Egyptians built pyramids. The Chinese, the Egyptians appear to be one of the first civilizations, if not the first civilization. No matter what is said, they appear to be preceded by the Ethiopians. No matter what is said, no matter what is denied, From what I can tell, the oldest fossil, as far as I can, am, am familiar with, was found in Ethiopia. Human fossil. Circle goes wider, wider, wider. Pyramids built without mortar between the stones. Architectural wonder. So they did chemistry. medical science, mathematics, all these things that we find wonderful now, all of that. It is said that Plato himself went to Egypt to learn from the Egyptian priests and that he stayed there for 13 years and then developed his own school whether well, it's history or whether it's fable if you can prove that wonderful we know Abraham according to the Bible itself went into Egypt that's already written the Bible itself says that some of the things that are written in it are allegories says that in the New Testament. I guess history itself is a story told. What am I saying? What my parents told me. My daddy told me, my mama told me, eat the meat, throw away the bones, use what you can. all of life. Use what you can. Don't despise the good. We all have good. We all have good. That's what I'm trying to say. We all have good. Namaste.